Thank you all for standing by and welcome to the third webinar of our fall series entitled Climate Change in, the, in Great Lakes Wetlands. These webinars are an initiative of the Ohio State University Climate Change Outreach Team, a multi-departmental effort within the university led by OSU Extension, Ohio Sea Grant, Bird Polar Research Center, and six other OSU departments to help localize the climate change issue for Ohioans and Great Lakes residents. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and joining me today is Dr. Bill Mitch from The Ohio State University. Dr. Mitch is a distinguished professor within the School of Environment and Natural Resources and the director of the Olentangy River Wetland Research Park at The Ohio State University. His research and teaching over his 37-year 30 year career have focused on ecology, uh, creation of a creation and restoration of wetlands from all over the world, including the Florida Everglades and here in the Great Lakes region at NOAA's Old Woman Creek National Estuarine Research Reserve in Ohio. He has authored or co-authored over 300 publications and 17 books, including the popular textbooks Wetlands and Ecological Engineering. In 1991, he founded the Olentangy River Wetland Research Park located on OSU's campus where, he, where he is the director. Because of his efforts, lifetime achievements in the modeling, management, and conservation of lakes and wetlands, Dr. Mitch was awarded the Stockholm Water Prize in, in 2004. We're delighted to have Dr. Mitch here today to discuss how wetlands could play a key role in our changing climate. But before we do that, a few logistical issues as we get started. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, we'll conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll collect and pose your questions out to Dr. Mitch at the end of his presentation. We have more than 150 participants on this webinar, a great diverse group representing governmental agencies, academia, and nonprofit groups from the Great Lakes and around the country. Please keep those questions coming throughout the presentation, and we should have a great Q&A session. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better web webinars. Without any further delay, I would like to introduce Dr. Bill Mitch from The Ohio State University, who will present Climate Change in Great Lakes Wetlands. Dr. Mitch, I am going to unmute you. You are unmuted, and I am going to give you a presenter role. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Jill. And we can go ahead with the first slides. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about climate change in the Great Lakes wetlands, but it'll be the Great Lakes region that I talk about. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to give this presentation to such a broad audience, and I hope it will be provocative and we'll uh, be happy to entertain questions at the end, of course. I think we should start out with a preamble that I would always start out when I talk about wetlands, that they provide valuable ecosystem services. Uh, we used to call them values, and, and, um, and uh, now we call them ecosystem services. But the basic ideas of wetlands improving water quality, uh, serving as mitigating ecosystems for floods, uh, that they are absolute, uh, both islands and corridors for biodiversity. Uh, they provide functions of carbon sequestration that I'll be talking about today. And of course, their locations for human relaxation, nature observation, and education, and many other ecosystem functions. Uh, they are among the most valuable ecosystems on the planet. Uh, I should mention this picture that you see right now is actually a sketch of uh, our concept. I don't think they're doing it, but that is the uh, skyline of Cleveland in the background. Uh, it suggests what could be done down in the lower Cuyahoga uh, if they ever wanted to really restore that area right before it uh, discharges into Lake Erie. I have this graphic to remind us where the Great Lakes watershed is and where the Great Lakes are, of course, um, uh, in Canada and the US. And it shows two different scales, uh, both of which I'm going to be talking about. It shows the watershed itself. That's in the uh, orange color. And it also shows the contiguous uh, political boundaries of the 
provinces and states. And more or less, I would say what I'm going to be presenting will be applicable to not just the watersheds themselves, uh, but also to the the region. We call it the Great Lakes Basin and region, which includes uh, areas that are slightly outside of the uh, watershed itself. Well, there are two views of wetland ecosystem services and climate change. Um, and it depends who's doing the study. They will have one of these two orientations. One view is what will climate change do to ecosystem services provided by wetlands? And I will address that uh, relatively briefly in this um, talk. And the other way to look at it is what do e what ecosystem services do wetlands provide to mitigate climate change? So you have both the effects of climate change on wetlands and the effect of wetlands on climate change. I will be addressing, I would guess in my talk, 30% uh, on the first and 70% on the last or something like that. So first of all, we talk about climate change effects on wetlands. First of all, it's very uh, difficult. It's, it's uh, even dangerous to start to predict the future 100 years in advance. But there have been various projections. This is one that was published a few years ago by the Union of Concerned Scientists of the Ecological Society of America uh, on climate change in the Great Lakes region. And it suggests that a whole number of possible changes that could occur I'm just showing you one. I'm just showing you the projected air temperature for the Great Lakes region relative to 1961-90 and how it projects forward to the year 2100. And you can see considerable rise in, in temperature, and uh, depending, of course, on what scenario you have. Um, most of the projections that I've been able to see for the Great Lakes suggest warmer summer temperatures. Uh, they suggest that uh, perhaps precipitation will not be drastically different, but what will be different is perhaps uh, greater evapotranspiration in the summer. So using that premise uh, and that model or those predictions, um, that particular report came up with some general concepts or general predictions related to um, ecological and social effects of uh, climate change in the Great Lakes region. I'm going to emphasize only the ones that related to wetlands. The first one, and probably the most important, is that lake levels themselves are expected to decline as more moisture evaporates due to the warmer temperatures and less ice cover. And that has gigantic implications for anything coastal in, on the Great Lakes. Reduced summer water levels are likely to diminish the recharge of groundwater, causing small streams to dry up and reduce the area of wetlands. That would be on tributary streams. But you would have earlier spring runoff, more intense flooding, and lower summer uh, water levels would translate into ch growing challenges for bogs and other wetlands in the region. And the combined pressures of development and climate change will degrade flood absorbing capacities of wetlands and floodplains, potentially uh, resulting in increased erosion and so on. Now, wetland losses uh, and changes in flood pulses will uh, likely reduce uh, breeding sites for amphibians, uh, migratory shorebirds. Uh, and waterfowl, and they may cause migratory species such as Canadian geese to winter further north. Uh, there are probably a lot of people that would applaud that particular one, for example. <laughs> the increased evaporation uh, would likely shrink wetland habitat and dry up prairie potholes. Uh, new wetlands, however, might be created, and I want to emphasize this as the lake edges drop, and I'll illustrate that in a minute. And the warmer temperatures also are likely to accelerate some of the things we're going to be talking about. Uh, CO2 and especially methane releases from peatlands and wetlands in general. Now, it's one thing to talk about the effect of coastal wetlands when you're talking about uh, oceanic systems, because climate change is predicted to increase ocean levels. And what they are predicting in that case is for the water levels in the, uh, on the oceanic systems to increase and sort of pinch out wetlands. Uh, they get squeezed out because there's development on the upland side and, and there's no left room left for wetlands. Well, with the scenario on the Great Lakes of reduced water levels, um, you're going to have exactly the opposite thing happening perhaps on the Great Lakes. But I think the most important thing to illustrate, and I show it here with a graphic that shows actually the water levels above sea level uh, 
in uh, Lake Michigan, that's the blue line on the top, and uh, Lake Erie, the red line on the bottom. And one of the extraordinary things about the lake levels uh, on the Great Lakes is that you can see between the low uh, lake levels, let's say in the 1930s, at least in Lake Erie, uh, and the high levels, like in the 19... Uh, 89, 90, and I kind of remember those. Uh, they were called all-time highs. You've got about 1.5 meters difference in elevation. Well, 1.5 meters elevation to any self-respecting wetland is enormous. And so there was not this idea of a, uh, a coastal wetlands being uh, the same every year around the Great Lakes that you have. It's not as predictable a, a flooding regime, or, or certainly not a tidal regime, uh, that you have on uh, coastal wetlands like salt marshes and mangroves. So therefore, uh, and it was several years ago, and you can tell by the, the date and the, uh, the, the sketchy diagram, we published this idea that we, we viewed wetlands that were left alone, ones that are not managed that they were more or less uh, vegetation communities on skateboards. And as the water level went up in the Great Lakes, the vegetation communities would tend to move upland. And as the water levels moved down, the vegetation communities would tend to go uh, lakeward. And so one has to imagine that that's what the landscape was before human beings came in and had property uh, rights and property ownership and started to put more or less formal uh, barriers on, on the coastline. And so we really have run out of wetlands that have this ability to move up and down. There are very few wetlands that can do that kind of uh, movement of vegetation, given the, uh, uh, the restrictions of land ownership and so on. But a lot of, and then the other thing you have to remember about a lot of the wetlands, not all by any means, a lot of the wetlands along the Great Lakes, at least the coastal ones, are significantly managed. They're managed to be for waterfowl, they're managed for hunt clubs or whatever, and often even pumps are involved, as I'm illustrating here, where uh, during, when there's high water, water, they will pump water out of the wetland, and when there's low water, they'll perhaps even pump water into the wetland and maintain a relatively artificial hydro period. So one is to suspect that that kind of management will continue, and so that will be probably the least affected. The one that will be more affected will be the natural wetlands that have to depend on the Great Lakes levels. And as we, as we pointed out, the lake levels, by some predictions, are, are going to be uh, lower in the next uh, decades than they are now. But again, that's a prediction that uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Now. What ecosystem services do wetlands provide to mitigate climate change? This is the part that I'm going to spend most of my time talking about. One of the things that we have been looking at in the last uh, uh, few years in my lab, and, and not only in Ohio but around the world, is carbon sequestration by wetlands. Now, this is a table uh, that suggests some of the ranges. This was published in my book in 2007. And it suggests at the time what we do about carbon sequestration rates. I'm going to be talking about grams carbon per meter squared per year a lot in this discussion. So the numbers suggest uh, boreal peatlands, temperate peatlands, relative low numbers, 10 to 20, 10 to 50 range. Um, and then Ulysses et al. published a paper in 2006, which was rather significant because it suggested some restored prairie pothole uh, wetlands uh, in the prairie pothole region were sequestering as much as 300 uh, grams of carbon per meter square per year compared to uh, natural wetlands in the same region that weren't restored, which was uh, significantly lower. And you're going to see we're going to see something like that later on in my presentation. Um, so the box illustrates that comparison. Now, that's the good news about wetlands and, and, and what they can do to, to help sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, the concern, though, and one of the things that I think the IPCC and other uh, organizations such as that focus on, perhaps even more than they do on carbon sequestration in wetlands, is the idea that wetlands serve as fluxes or serve as sources for greenhouse gases, the most significant of which uh, probably is methane. And this graphic illustrates a sort of a methane flux for, for the world of 535 uh, teragrams per carbon 
uh, as CH4, sorry, per year, and it suggests that natural wetlands may be providing a significant portion of that. In fact, it, wetlands are considered to be the predominant natural source of methane to the atmosphere. But you can see the others under anthropocentric uh, is a gigantic number, and that's because of humans, uh, especially due to uh, uh, landfills and other uh, sources of methane. But wetlands continue to be mentioned as the most significant natural source of methane to the atmosphere. Uh, and also, I guess I will include rice paddies as sort of heavily managed wetlands, but they are wetlands nonetheless, and they contribute another 60 teragrams. Um, Bloom et al. In, in January of 2011 in Science suggested that wetlands and rice paddies were contributing even more, and they came up with 227 teragrams of, of methane. And they also suggested, and you can see it by this graphic, that most of that methane was actually coming from the tropics. Um, and they suggested also some from the Arctic and so on. But uh, they started to bring focus, and we agree with this, that, that, that a lot of the so-called carbon action, if you will, of wetlands really is in, the, is, is in the tropics. So here we're left with a dilemma for wetlands and their role in climate um, mediation or climate mitigation, uh, climate change mitigation, and that is wetlands offer one of the best natural environment sequestration and long-term storage of carbon, and we're going to get into that uh, quite a bit later on, and yet are also natural sources of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, particularly methane. Both of these processes are due to the same anaerobic conditions caused by shallow water and saturated soils that are features of wetlands. So what I'm going to do now is uh, go to some specific studies that we've done over the years comparing carbon sequestration and methane emissions in the Great Lakes region uh, and created in natural wetlands. The two sites I'm going to focus on uh, are, first of all, Old Woman Creek National Western Reserve up on Lake Erie. We're referring to that as Old Woman Creek. And then the other site is right in central Ohio, our Olentangy River Wetland Research Park, which are created wetland basins in the uh, Scioto River Basin. So those are the two sites we'll be speaking about for the, a lot of the rest of this talk. Um, Old Woman Creek, I'm not going to talk very much. I've got one picture, and, and we'll go from there. Uh, this shows the Malumbo Ludia, uh, or water lotus, out in the main body. Of, this is what I always remember Old Woodland Creek mostly as. It's got other plant communities, of course, but uh, and it's a, it's a wetland that is more or less naturally connected to Lake Erie. Um, uh, it it uh, is connected through a, a, a channel that sometimes shuts off naturally due to moving uh, marine sediments and sometimes opens up in the spring. So it's a very dynamic water level. It, it receives satius from time to time, and yet it remains the closest thing we have to, I'd say, a normal wetland, at least on the Ohio shoreline of, of Lake Erie. Um, this is a photograph of the experiment, one of the two experimental wetlands at the Olentangy River Wetland Research Park. Notice, by the way, it's not an accident uh, of the photograph that this one shows the Lumbo Ludia also growing in that wetland, uh, but it shows a, a number of other plant communities around, and it also shows a lot of boardwalks and and sampling devices and so on as well. These are very, very studied wetlands. Um, I'm going to spend a little time talking about uh, these wetlands at the Olentangy wetland because perhaps a lot of our audience uh, uh, outside of the state of Ohio are not as familiar with it. This is an aerial photo of the approximately 20 hectare site. Uh, it's contiguous with the Ohio State University. And what you see there in the picture, and I'm going to try to use a pointer what you see there are the experimental wetlands, this says Bill Mitch. <laughs> uh, those two wetlands are the ones we're going to be talking about mostly, but you can also see a wetland that uh, we created, these are all created wetlands, the wetland that we created that uh, receives natural flooding from the river, whereas the flooding from these two wetlands, uh, because they're laboratories, is pumped from the river. And then the third system we have, I won't talk about very much, but you should be aware of, is this bottom line hardwood forest that we've restored the hydrology to as well. So we've got three distinct hydro periods, if you will, out at this site, um, depending on what you want to study and what your interests are. Most of the emphasis will be on these experimental wetlands. 
Uh, this project, I'll just, I have to give you a little bit of history, I'm sorry. Uh, we are 20 years old this year because we sort of date ourselves with the newspapers and, and in uh, May of 1991, the Columbus Dispatch ran a story that said Swamp may be next on OSU campus and they actually drew that little sketch. Uh, our wetlands don't look anything like that, but uh, actually this was the beginning of, uh, of a long process to develop these wetlands and set them up as research sites. Uh, it is a study in primary succession we actually sculpted the land clean. You cannot see it, but there's a basin in front of that uh, machine, and uh, and they were uh, dug with uh, with laser precision, literally, and so therefore they created them exactly as we wanted. And they are each, by the way, one hectare in size. We did that so our calculations could be easy. This is a rare photo that shows a couple things. It shows the wetland research park. Uh, two days after we started adding water, I believe. This was in March of 1994. And you can see the shape, the kidney-shaped wetland, and of course there's no vegetation, there's nothing. It's this absolutely the, the one or two days after the, the wetlands, what we call birth date in early March 1994. You can also point out that little building on the right was our only building out at the site at the time. So, what have we done with those experimental wetlands? Well, we've maintained a very, uh, our program of maintaining the hydrology is based very simply on what is the river doing today. So we have a, uh, a policy of correcting the pumping to the, the wetlands are pumped. There's no question about that. But the pumping depends on the river level and we correct that five or six times a week. And that's why you can see this pattern from 1994 to 2008, that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about, where there's uh, dramatic pulses and there's droughts and so on, that's all tuned to whatever the river is doing. And the other important point of this graphic suggests that uh, there are two graphics here. There's one for wetland one, and there's one for wetland two, and those are the uh, two experimental wetlands that I'll explain in a minute, wet, wetland one and wetland two. But they are identical hydroperiods in those two. We, we make sure that the absolute same uh, hydrology flows into both of them. So since we had to, we decided to do an experiment. And in, in uh, 1994, after we added water, uh, we actually pumped, or I'm sorry, we actually planted one of the wetlands, and that will remain wetland one. So you'll see me referring to wetland one all the time. Just think planted. And if you hear me say wetland two, just think of one that was not planted. So that remains, even to today, our overall ecosystem experiment out here, and it's been fascinating to follow that. Uh, for those of you who are botanically inclined, listed here are the 13 species that we introduced. And you can see with the asterisk as well, uh, the list of the uh, species that are still there. Nine of the 13 species that we introduced are still there. Now this graphic shows the initial, the very, very early success of the plants, which ones, and that's when we were actually counting every little stem. Uh, as a rule, I would say the ones that were successful early are the ones that are not successful later on. So uh, the early success meant nothing as far as, as what we ultimately had. Uh, some of the dominant species, in case you're interested, out there are Spargenium. Uh, we have uh, Sagittaria. We have uh, Potomagetan. And uh, you saw the Limbo Ludia. And uh, Shedoplectus taverna montani, which is uh, soft stem bulrush, uh, has always been common in the wetland. Now, that's the planted species. What I have to point out, and what I'm not going to belabor, because I'm not going to talk about this experiment per se very much, is that that's 13 species. There are now 100 plus species of plants in each of the two experimental wetlands. That's a story to be told later. But our hypothesis was, and it re remains, the planted unplanted wetlands will be similar in function in the beginning, diverge in function in middle years, and ultimately converge in structure and function. Um, this is sort of a tricky hypothesis because we really didn't say what middle years were. Uh, I have a couple aerial photos that sort of tell the story that year two, and on the bottom in each of these graphics will be wetland one. So the north arrow which should be pointing to the left 
uh, Wetland One was planted, and clearly in the second year, it was very easy for me to say, well, that's the one with the plants, and the other one had nothing. Um, but fast forward to year 12, 2005, and a wholly different story picks out. You can see, of course, there are deep water areas that were meant to be too deep for plants, uh, and those remain open water. And then there are uh, the middle parts of each wetland are dominated by a whole array of, of macrophytes. You can almost see the different communities from this aerial photo. And then uh, the fringe of woody plants that has come in around the edge as well. We didn't plant any woody plants at all. They've all come in naturally. So that's year 12, which was 2005. And I guess we lost uh, year 16 because of the transfer to an IBM. But uh, it showed something very similar. Now, the, over those uh, year between 1994 and 2008, and by the way, I give a source down at the bottom, uh, this 15-year uh, study from, two, from 1999 to 2008 is going to be published in, bio, in the March issue of Bioscience. So a lot of what I'm showing you will be published uh, in a few months. But what we see from this graphic is exactly the paradox, if you will, of of the planting experiment. The top graphic is a, we call it CDI, Community Diversity Index. It's an index that we came up with of being able to measure more or less community index, but from, from uh, the aerial photos that we do every year and with the ground truthing. And it suggests that the so-called planted wetland has remained and continues to remain a little bit more diverse than the unplanted wetland. So if you are in for diversity, then you should plant a wetland. On the other hand, if you look at the bottom graph, which is sort of the cumulative productivity that we uh, we estimate net primary productivity, above ground net primary productivity every year in these wetlands, and the cumulative number uh, has remained much higher by about uh, 10, 15 percent than the uh, planted wetland. It's remained much higher in the so-called unplanted wetland. So. One of the interesting things we found is that there's more productivity in the unplanted wetland than the planted one. Uh, that, of course, uh, is a great subject for discussion as well. And it does come later on, I think, to cause uh, suggest a, a different pattern of carbon uh, when we talk about some of the data. You'll see it later when you. So just remember that we're getting more carbon accumulation in the so-called unplanted wetland because, of course, it's selected for plants like. Uh, typha and very productive plants, whereas the other one has plants that are, are less, uh, less, less productive but more diverse, I guess you'd call it. Um, again, I'm not going to talk much about water quality, but this is also going to be in that bioscience paper in great detail. It suggests the 15-year pattern of uh, phosphorus, total phosphorus, soluble reactive phosphorus, and nitrate, nitrogen retention in the wetlands uh, over those 15 years. What I am not showing you because of lack of time is the comparison between the two wetlands, but I can just tell you they are pretty much identical. There was no, it didn't matter whether you planted or didn't plant as far as nutrient retention. But what is a more significant pattern is what we're showing here with the trends. And there are clear, very strong trends for de decreases in phosphorus decrease. In other words, the wetland is still retaining 20 to 30 percent of uh, phosphate or phosphorus. I'm sorry, but it's much less than what it was in the early years. So you see a trend drifting to the to, from uh, low to high, or uh, minus 60 to minus 20. You see something similar to that for soluble reactive phosphorus, but it's still retaining 30 percent or more. And you see much less of a trend for that for nitrates. And in fact, if you look at those data as the, I look at them. It suggests in the last four years of this uh, study that there's actually been an improvement in nitrate retention in this wetland, and we'd like to think that that trend is going to continue. Oh, well, I think we lost a graphic there, too. Um, I think we're going to lose some photographs is what we're losing. Um, this illustrates, so what I'm explaining here is uh, sort of a study that uh, we did on the side not on the side. We had funding for this uh, 
to try pulsing and steady flow years in these experimental wetlands. We have the pumps. We should try some experiments. So in 2004, both wetlands were subjected to pulsing hydrology. And in 2005, we had the most boring uh, every day, the same amount of water going to those wetlands the entire year. And this is results from Ann Alter and her thesis, and we published it uh, in 2008, that suggests that at least for part of the wetlands, and that's the continuously flooded areas, there was a significantly more methane emitted from the wetlands when it was steady flow as compared to pulsing. Again, that, that's uh, what I'm suggesting is score one for pulsing, that, that the pulsing hydrology perhaps minimizes um, the generation of greenhouse gases from wetlands, at least in certain locations like these deep water areas. Similarly, if you look at this graphic, this was uh, Maria Hernandez who did a PhD looking at denitrification and also the greenhouse gas nitrous oxide. If you look at the bottom graph, it illustrates the, uh, the nitrous oxide emissions during the pulsing year and during the steady flow year. And statistically, I don't, I'm sorry I don't have the letters on this, but statistically the two circled areas, which was in the spring, there was significantly more nitrous oxide, at least in certain parts of the wetland, and those would be the, what we call the high marsh, uh, during steady flow conditions as compared to pulsing. So again, it suggests that greater greenhouse gases, at least some conditions, uh, during steady flow conditions as compared to pulsing. So again, that's good for arguing for pulsing hydrology. Likewise, if you look at the top graph, we're looking at denitrification. Uh, you can see what I have circled here are the two periods in which there was a significant difference between denitrification during the pulsing time, which is shown here, and during the non-pulsing time here. So that's another value we're suggesting of the natural pulsing hydrology that it tends to maximize, in some cases, denitrification. So those are three conditions that I just suggested that pulsing hydrology is favorable to what we want to do, and that is either minimize greenhouse gases or maximize the retention of nitrate in wetlands. Um, okay, so the methane we've been studying, this uh, shows one of my current graduate students, Blanca Bernal, uh, taking soil cores from wetlands, and we've done that around the world. Uh, I'm only going to present Ohio data today, where we're able to take uh, cores and analyze them by all sorts of means, not the least of which is uh, using uh, 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 cesium detection uh, to estimate the accumulation of carbon over a unit over time. Uh, I won't go into the details of how we do that, but uh, the methods are quite quite good and they give us robust uh, answers and and, uh, and we're going to share some of those with you of what we've seen in the Ohio in the Great Lakes region. Okay, this graphic uh, has a lot but I'm going to try to uh, summarize it. Um, these are some of our overall numbers that we've got. Let's talk about them one column at a time. First of all, you can see the red are the created wetlands from the uh, uh, Olentangy River wetlands site. You notice uh, we have a comparison of W1, which was the planted wetland, and W2, which was the unplanted. We are consistently, no matter who's measuring it, seeing higher methane emissions from the so-called unplanted wetland that was more productive, and that makes sense. Um, then you can see the number at what we call the natural wetland, which was Old Woman Creek wetland right on Lake Erie, and it's a considerably higher, at least considerably higher than the average of the two wetlands down here that were created. And then for illustration, I've put uh, a number that is more about representative of what they're finding in some of the northern peatlands, uh, the rates of methane emissions. So you can see our freshwater marshes are, are much higher than what has been reported in, in the peatland literature. Now, that's the, that's the negative part of wetlands, if you will. Now, here's the positive part, carbon sequestration. I feel like these numbers are very robust. We've, we were able to, because we started from scratch in our wetland, get very good estimates of the carbon sequestration in the created wetlands. And you can see two things. You can see, first of all, 
I, I'm not going to say it's higher, but it looks like the so-called unplanted wetland is slightly higher in carbon sequestration. But again, we only have two wetlands here. Um, it also suggests that uh, the numbers are considerably higher than the natural wetland at Old Creek, where we get an average of about 140, whereas at these created wetlands, we're getting averages well above 200. I think the other thing to point out is it looks like as we go along 2006 to 2008, the accumulation rates are higher than what they were measured before. That means that there's still an acceleration of carbon sequestration going on in these 15-year-old wetlands. How long that will continue, we don't know. So we're saying that created wetlands are sequestering more carbon, and we're also saying that that's not slowing down at the 15-year mark. And again, I'm comparing it also to the more standard literature that gets out there and is used to talk about wetlands, and that is what's going on in the peatlands of the north and the rates of carbon sequestration are, I would say, at an order of magnitude lower there than what we're seeing in these uh, wetlands in Ohio. Now, let's go to this. This is a very important point, and I'm going to hopefully explain to you what this all means. There is a uh, there is a tax that you have to appropriate to methane. Uh, you can't just simply say grams of carbon sequestrated versus grams of methane emitted, and I'll go into what that is in a minute. But right here, when I convert the gram CO2 uh, sequestered to the grams methane produced from the wetlands, you can see I'm getting, uh, and those are CO2 and CH4 now. We're not using carbon anymore. You can see the ranges of 16 to 46 uh, in the experimental wetlands, 7 to 1 at Old Woman Creek, and an average, perhaps, of all the peatland studies that we saw of about 12 to 1 average of gram CO2 sequestered to gram CH4. Okay, so if you can kind of remember those numbers, they will come back later in my presentation. Here's the problem. The standard global warming potential used by the International Panel on Climate Change uh, and others to compare methane and carbon dioxide is now 25 to 1. So if I go back to that graphic, every one of those numbers has to be greater than 25 to 1 for those to be good wetlands. Now. We've, and I'll get to this in a minute, uh, we have been able to compare uh, sites where they've measured methane, meth, uh, methane production or methanogenesis with uh, carbon sequestration. And there's a R squared of 0.5, which in ecology is not that bad at all, that suggests there's a, not a cause and effect, but that they are related. When you get high carbon sequestration, you get high uh, methane emissions often. But if you take the slope of this line, and let's just assume that that's a relationship, uh, of 0.14. Um, you have to bear with me on this calculation. On average, that means that methane emitted from wetlands as carbon is 14% of the wetland carbon sequestration. So on a carbon basis, you're fine. We're taking much more carbon out of the atmosphere of wetlands than we're emitting. But that's a 7 to 1, 7.1 to 1 sequestration to methane ratio. And if you convert that to the uh, CO2 methane ratio, it ends up being 20 to 1 or 19.5 19 to 1, um, a, as uh, much less than the 25 to 1 ratio that's needed. It could be concluded from this simple comparison that the world's wetlands are net sources of radiative forcing on climate, that the world's wetlands are warming the climate. Now, admittedly, there's a lot of noise in those data. And that concerned us when we saw this. So I'm back to my two Ohio wetlands. These are the numbers I think we showed you earlier. They, we've only converted them to CO2 and methane. And for the temperate natural wetland at Old Woman Creek, we have a CO2 CH4 ratio of 7 to 1. And if I take my two Old and Tangy wetlands and average them, uh, give me a little more strength on the calculation, we're 17 to 1. Neither of those ratios is 25 to 1 or greater. That concerned us. We would conclude that neither of these wetlands is good for climate. They are net sources of radio forcing, and the ratios are less than 25 to 1. Well, um, I do modeling sometimes, and it occurred to me that, there, that this was not as simple as, as we had it. So we developed a little mathematical model. It wasn't detailed at all. That really took into account these two major fluxes. 
This is not a detailed model. We're not uh, putting net prior production in per se. We are basically have a model that has two things for all these uh, for, for various wetlands where we found data. One is the carbon sequestration is shown by this arrow here. Uh, and it's the net result, by the way, of the gross production and respiration of plants, respiration from the soil of the ecosystem. Okay, so that's a that's the CO2 part of the model. Then the other part of the model is, is uh, we call it F sub ME, is the net emissions of methane that go up into a little methane cloud in this so-called atmosphere above this wetland. And But these are connected, and they're connected in a couple ways. Uh, the, the methane decays to CO2. The CO2 does not decay per se. It's taken in and out of the ecosystem, but the CO2 remains in the atmosphere or, or, or increases or decreases, of course. But uh, we're basically taking CO2 out and, and releasing methane. But the key thing is we have degradation of methane. And we're, our model is a very simple model without going into details. It's two differential equations, uh, one for atmospheric methane, one for carbon in the or atmospheric carbon dioxide. Uh, so you notice it's an atmosphere model. It is a model of a representative square meter that goes up as high as we want it to go. There's no limit on the elevation um, of the atmosphere, theoretical atmosphere, over top of a square meter of wetland, starting at point zero, of course. And uh, it's got methane emissions from the wetlands, and it's got carbon sequestration emissions. These two F values are shown here. So there, it's, it's, it's a model with two simultaneous differential equations. And we define the, the, uh, the, the carbon dioxide equivalent as the amount of carbon dioxide that we have in the atmosphere, where we're starting from zero, plus the, the uh, uh, GWP times the methane. And the GWP that we've presented here is 25. So we're putting a 25 tax on any methane that ends up in our theoretical atmosphere. Uh, I don't want to take any more describing this model, but it's an elegantly simple one. And when we run that model for our two wetlands, and I'll show you a simulation later for all so other wetlands, we end up with a net sequestration of carbon in both wetlands. It's a net sequestration. But we also find out that the wetland trans transfers from being a source to being a sink in the case of Oldham Creek after 31 years of simulation. And then when we split wetland one and wetland two, wetland one from our experimental wetland already was, it already passed the 25 test, whereas wetland two, it took 16 simulated years for it to occur. And after 100 years, the ratios are gigantic, you know, much, much more uh, CO2 uh, accumulated uh, than methane released. And the ratio is well, well above that 25 that we, that is so sacred. Now, we took this one step further. We found 15 additional cases where methane emissions and carbon sequestration were estimated the same wetland, and data were published in peer-reviewed literature. That was very important. So out of these uh, three wetlands we had, plus these 15, out of the 18 wetlands, using about only four had CO2 over CH4 ratios that we've been talking about here graded. So only four of the 18 wetlands were what we would call good wetlands by the by the terminology that's used. This is what the simulations look like, and they include, by the way, the two created wetlands here and here from Old Woman Creek, or I'm sorry, from the Olentangy wetlands, and this one called Ohio Marsh, that is the Old Woman Creek wetland. And then we found all these other peatlands and marshes and so on in the literature and ran simulations for them. And it suggests with all these lines are crossing, the zero line is what is sacred. When the, when the uh, line is above, this is CO2 equivalent, when the line is above zero, it means that it is a source of radiative forcing. And when the line goes below zero, it's a sink for radiative forcing. And all the lines go below zero within a 100-year span except for two. And they're worth pointing out that's this line and this line. Uh, those will never go below zero because those particular wetlands were carbon dioxide sources to begin with. And I'm sorry, if it's a carbon dioxide source, I can't help it. It's got to be accumulating carbon in the soil for this model to show that it's uh, And most wetlands, unless they're drained, are indeed carbon sequestration systems. 
But you can see they all pass the test uh, in, in flying colors. Um, so this allowed us to take one more leap of faith here. We divided them into, into to what latitudes where they are. We found the carbon neutral years, and we came up with general rates for the tropics, the temperate, and the boreal. And you notice, of course, most of the studies that have been done have been done in boreal regions, and we have found a significantly higher carbon sequestration, net carbon sequestration, uh, both in tropical and temperate wetlands, such as the ones I've described here. What you also need to know for this calculation to extrapolate to the world is how many wetlands there are in the world. Uh, there are countless studies that we've been summarizing for years in our book, but uh, this study by Lerner and Dahl looks like it's the best. And they're suggesting anywhere from 8 to 10 million square kilometers of wetlands in the world. Furthermore, they have been able to divide them into uh, where they are found, whether they're in the tropics, the boreal regions, or the temperate zone. Now, the temperate zone, this is where we live. Uh, don't ask me why, but most wetland ecologists are in the part of the world with the least wetlands, uh, including us. But uh, nevertheless, it suggests that there's uh, a lot of wetlands in the world. Taking the estimates of area, distributing them according to this distribution, uh, taking these three rates that I suggested we got from our, our data, and adding them up against the area. And again, this is a very conservative uh, area estimate for wetlands. Seven million square kilometers is very conservative. Some of my friends are suggesting there's 10 to 12 uh, million square kilometers or whatever. Uh, so we're suggesting a relatively conservative number there. These are the numbers that we estimated the net effect of after subtracting off the uh, methane. You multiply those together, add them up, and you get 1.1 petagram of carbon per year retained by the world's wetlands. This is the world. So you notice how I jumped from Ohio to the world very quickly. But it was the studies in Ohio that really stimulated us to, to look at this question on a bigger scale. Now, what does 1.1 petagram, and that's 10 to the 15th grams of carbon, by the way, uh, petagram on a year, what, what is that? What does that mean? Well, let's look at the carbon budget of the world, and that's what I've shown here. Wetlands are featured in it because we wanted to know what's going on. First of all, in petagrams per year, uh, we're now producing seven, and in fact, this might be seven and a half. This number is not slowing down, by the way, folks. It, it, every time I do this graphic, it gets higher. So we have perhaps seven petagrams of, of uh, CO2 coming, most, mostly CO2, coming from burning of fossil fuels. Uh, so that's the smokestack number. And you can see, of course, that some of that goes in the ocean. That ocean number keeps changing. Uh, forests aren't doing us any good because we're still, the estimates out there are still saying that deforestation is a net source of CO2 to the atmosphere. So where's the hidden, and then what I've circled here is exactly the numbers that we're estimating, and they are very tied very well into that study that I mentioned at the very beginning of my, my talk by Bloom et al. that suggests about 0.17 uh, petagram of, of CH4 as carbon, these are all as carbon, uh, coming from wetlands uh, and, and uh, rice paddies into the atmosphere. But the key point, and the one point two is because you have to add back the methane generation, is that we are suggesting that there's 1.2 petagram of carbon being accumulated in the world's wetlands right now as we speak. And if you compare that to the seven on the upper left corner, I, I think we're suggesting that there's a lot more study that need, be, need to be done. There's a lot more especially work we have to do, especially in the tropics, but we're suggesting that perhaps wetlands could be the lost carbon sink. Uh, people are wondering where's all the carbon going, and uh, wetlands could be much more significant. I can tell you in earlier editions of my book, that number was one order of magnitude lower than what I'm showing you here. So at least we've got the discussion going, we hope, of the idea that wetlands could be very significant relative to their extent on the landscape as carbon sequestration systems on the planet. So I'll come up with some conclusions over my broad scales that I've just gone on. First of all, there are both positive and negative effects of reduced Great Lakes levels and increased evapotranspiration expected from climate change on the extent of coastal Great Lakes wetlands. We told you there are some conditions where we're going to lose wetlands, but there's this idea as the lakes drop in water level, there's going to be uh, substrate available for wetlands to develop as well. So it's, it's a 
two-edged sword as far as uh, what we're going to have as far as wetlands right around the lakes. Then let's jump to our study. We say that planting does have some effect on ecosystem function and created wetlands even several years after planting. And the greenhouse gas emissions, nitrous oxide and methane, are lower in wetlands during pulsing than in steady flow conditions under some conditions. Carbon sequestration is higher in newly created wetlands than in similar natural wetlands in the Great Lakes region. We're consistently seeing higher numbers in our experimental wetlands than we see in most natural wetlands. Most wetlands have evaluated with a simple 25 to 1 methane carbon dioxide ratio used by climate change policymakers are net sources of radiative forcing and hence bad for climate. Most wetlands are net sinks of radiative forcing on climate well within 100 to 200 years when the decay of methane in the atmosphere is factored in as we did in our very simple model. The world's wetlands, despite being only 7% of the terrestrial landscape or less than 2% of the globe, could be net sinks for a significant portion perhaps as much as 14% or more than one petagram per year of the carbon released by fossil fuel consumption. So we believe that wetlands can and should be created or restored to provide carbon sequestration and other ecosystem services in the Great Lakes region without great concern of creating net radiative sources on climate that is often proclaimed in the IPCC literature. Uh, this study, I appreciate it's, it's, it wasn't done in a day. We're talking about 25 years of research, perhaps, uh, coming to a conclusion. Uh, we, of course, had many staff, postdocs, graduate students, and other researchers who helped during the 25 years. We've had funding re most recently by the USDA, by the US EPA, National Science Foundation, OARDC, several endowments at the Olentangy Wetland Research Park, and thousands of donations, large and small, from supporters of our particular wetland park. Uh, acknowledge again the students, and of course this is our characteristic OHIO that we do at the Ohio State University. Uh, this was our uh, research team, I believe, in 2010. Again, 20-year uh, anniversary of our experimental wetlands and our wetlands at the Ohio State University. Uh, and I also want to mention that it is a Ramsar site, and we're celebrating the 40th anniversary this year of the Ramsar Convention on the protection of international wetlands as well. And thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mitch. That was great. Uh, we have gotten some really fantastic questions during the presentation. So let me get started and ask Dr. Mitch as many as we can. Um, the first question uh, we have is um, dealing more of a, a general wetland question. Um, Specifically, they, one viewer wanted to know, uh, are the Great Lakes wetlands a good representation of the majority of wetland locations across the lower uh, 48 states? You know, that's a good question. Um, they're sort of oddball. If, if you get, talk about the wetlands that are right around the lake, they're kind of like confused wetlands because of that lake level changes that I told you about. You know, they, they never, they're, they're never happy wetlands because of the lake's changing next year. But on the other hand, so that whether those are representative, I think perhaps not. Um, get a little bit further away from the lake into the watersheds and so on, yeah, I mean the wetlands that we have, they're mineral soil wetlands, would be very, very typical of what we see in the in the uh, United States. Then if you go up, uh, in, but you go up to Michigan, you go up and of course into the Canadian provinces, then you've got a completely different type of wetlands that develop in the landscape, and they're often isolated, and those are the peat bogs, you know, the old lake beds that uh, filled in with peat. Uh, they're a little different, and you t those tend to be typical from about uh, the, the Michigan State line north uh, on the landscape, whereas you come south, you got more, you have some peat lands to be sure in Ohio, but you've got more of a typical mineral soil wetland, like the ones, the two that I just talked about here. So, yeah, in many ways the wetlands are typical, but in many ways they're not. Uh, one of the things we have to realize is that what we are talking about here are the freshwater wetlands, uh, and a lot of attention is paid to salt marshes and mangrove swamps with regard to climate change and sea level rise and so on, but they only represent about 3 to 5 percent of the total wetlands, at least in the United States. So 95 percent of the wetlands are the interior type like I've been talking about here. Okay. Um, let me uh, 
get a couple questions in um, dealing with uh, carbon sequestration. We got quite a few questions on that. Um, one question that uh, someone asked was, uh, does the type of wetland make a difference in terms of uh, net carbon sequestration? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, in fact, we have a paper uh, that's uh, senior author is Blanca Bernal, my graduate student, uh, coming out soon, we hope, uh, that suggests that, and this was surprising to us, that isolated wetlands, ones that are don't have streams flowing through them is the best way I can describe them, uh, tended to sequester more carbon. I mean, one way you think about it, well, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but in another way, it would be really surprised us because the isolated wetlands are usually deter usually estimated to be less productive. So, so we're still not sure if that's a general principle. But yes, we found that the type of wetland, the type of community, very definitely makes a difference in, in the carbon sequestration. But we're finding for these mineral soil wetlands, like the ones I just described to you, the Old Woman Creek, the Old Jenji wetlands, the carbon sequestration rates that we're measuring are higher than almost all the general numbers that are used for wetlands around the world because most of the studies of climate change in wetlands are done in, in boreal peatlands and those numbers are low. Uh, there's a lot of boreal peatlands, there's no question about it, but we're saying there's there's other wetlands too and they might be more more effective carbon sequestration systems than we ever realized. Okay. Um, another question dealing with uh, carbon sequestration. Um, one viewer asked, is there a particular reason why created wetlands sequester more carbon compared to natural wetlands? Uh, that's, that's, a question, that's a good question. That's baffled us a little bit. Uh, but you think about it, it's, uh, it, it goes with our theories that we always learned about succession, that when, uh, when a system is in an early throes of succession, it's sort of building up biomass, it's building up structure, and then when it reaches some sort of uh, if you believe in autogenic succession, and some people don't, it reaches some sort of climax uh, ecosystem uh, that it consumes what it produces. So in a way, that if you follow that model, it makes a lot of sense that, the, that when you start a wetland from scratch, it's just building peat at an enormously rapid rate, and that is longer that wetland is around, perhaps the rate will slow. We just have no idea, really no idea, when that rate will start slowing down to resemble that in natural wetlands. Um, don't know if we'll be able to live long enough to do that study, but, but we are seeing over the 15, 20 year period, let's say, uh, that the wetlands are still sequestering much more carbon than what we're seeing from comparable uh, natural wetlands. Okay. Uh, when will the created wetlands reach a carbon sequestration peak? This was a, a question someone asked. They ask, can we assume that natural wetlands will reach a carbon sequestration point as well? And if so, won't the carbon emissions rates be greater than the combined carbon sequestration and methane emissions? And if so, what do we do with our wetlands? Oh, <laughs> next question. Um, okay, in the geological scale, wetlands are ephemeral parts of our landscape. They move around, they fill, they, uh, rivers move, you know, so in the big scale of things, um, wetlands are temporary things on the landscape. But in the time scale that we're interested in, which is 100, 200, 500 years maybe, I think wetlands are significant sinks of carbon and can be for thousands of years actually. Eventually, they, you know, it has to level off. Um, so I don't think we have a good sense of that yet. Um, but we also believe that creating wetlands does other things other than sequester carbon. In fact, there were a whole bunch of reasons why we've been building wetlands for 20 years before carbon even came along as a big issue. So we're just adding this to the list of reasons why we need to create wetlands. They don't do just one thing. They do a bunch of things, and they do many of them very well. And be happy with the fact that these systems are going to last for hundreds, I will say hundreds of years. Maybe not, I'll, I'll be sticking my neck out to say thousands, and nobody would be here to dispute it. But I, I would say over hundreds of years, we're creating a very, very good carbon sinks. And I want to contrast that with the traditional carbon sinks that usually people talk about are forests, 
farmlands and so on, and I think these numbers that I'm giving you today from wetlands just blow those numbers out of the water. Okay. Um, I have one more question from a middle school uh, down near uh, Dayton, Ohio, so I wanted sure. to, uh, to uh, ask for them. Uh, we realized that, we focus, that you focused on plants um, you added to your experimental wetlands, but we were wondering if any animal species were added to your experimental wetlands, and do animal populations play a role in methane emissions or carbon sequestration? That is a very good question. Isn't that a great question? Yeah. Um, of course the critters are there. Uh, and it's sort of a if you build it, they will come concept. We put the plants in, added water, and got out of the way. And the critters are in there, the fish are in there, the amphibians are in there. Uh, and a very good point of that question, I would say, is what we've had recently, when I've had my class out to these wetlands, um, our undergraduate students had to every day clean out uh, a dam that the beavers were building on the outflow of these wetlands, I mean, they want to flood it. And when beavers come in and change the hydrology, which they do in the Midwest big time and in the Great Lakes region, uh, you know, they they change the carbon, they change the methane emissions. Uh, there are some people that say beavers are really part of the, you know, the methane emission system that we have here. Um, and when you think about it, the Great Lakes region was where all the beaver hunting was when the French explorers were here. And, 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 uh, and there are some statistics that say that we've just swapped. And now that we have uh, 45 million people there, in, in the 1600s, we had 45 million beavers. And, and it, so it was a very dynamic landscape. And so yes, these critters, uh, if I may use that word, have enormous impacts on on the flux of methane, on the carbon sequestration, on the whole carbon dynamics of the landscape. I, I totally agree with that. It's, these are not like passive systems. They are very active systems. And the plants and animals and microbes are all acting uh, together. They know, what, they, know how to, they know how to do it together. OK. Well, um, we are actually out of time. We've, uh, we have a lot of other great questions, but unfortunately, we have run out of time. So uh, what I wanted to do was um, just close with uh, thanking Dr. Mitch for his willingness to talk with us today about Great Lakes wetlands and the impacts we could face with a changing climate. A really excellent discussion. Also, a thank you to uh, NOAA and the National Sea Grant College Program for funding this webinar. I did want to remind you that our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature. Please take a few minutes to fill that out. We would like your input as we develop a regional climate site, so please take some time if you could. I also wanted to refer you to resources and an archive of all previous webinar presentations which are located on our changingclimate.osu.edu website. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by the OSU Climate Change Outreach Team and will continue next month with a presentation by Ohio State University's Dr. Lonnie King, Dean of the College of Veterinarian Medicine, who will be discussing the concept of One Health and how a changing climate will affect environmental sustainability. Thank you again to Dr. Mitch and all participants on this webinar. We hope that this was beneficial and hope you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.